Sira Reading Contest is back with generous awards organized by Green Dome Foundation. This year's contest features two books, Muhammad, His Life Based on the Earliest Sources, and The Messenger, Prophet Muhammad and His Message of Compassion. The top 11 winners in each book's contest will receive $500 each. For the young readers under 14 years, the test will be from the book Prophet Muhammad, The Age of Bliss. The first 11 children in the contest will each receive a $100 Amazon gift card. For more information, please visit www.whoisprophetmuhammad.com. Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters. We are having a difficult time as Muslims and all humanity. We need to retreat more than ever to refocus on what truly matters in our lives. Join our four days virtual spiritual retreat program starting from December 24th to December 27th, 2020 with distinguished Muslim speakers across North America for daily speeches and various spiritual activities. Don't miss it. And please remember to join us with all your family members and friends on December 24th through December 27th every day at 2 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Salam TV YouTube channel. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be among you. Welcome to Virtual Spiritual Retreat of 2020. I'm Beza and I'll be your host. We're joining you live from Salam TV. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day and ready to benefit from today's retreat. Um, this program is about Muslims in American politics and a reminder that this will go for an hour and we will have 40 minutes where our speaker will speak for um, about the Muslims in American politics theme. And then at the end, we will have a generous amount of uh, time for questions and answer. We have a very special guest, Iman Joda, a representative-elect. Um, she will share her journey into politics and the importance for Muslims to be active in politics. But before I let her begin, I would like to make a small introduction. Uh, Iman Joda is a Muslim-American politician from Colorado, a member of the Democratic Party. She was elected to represent the 41st District in the Colorado House of Representatives in the 2020 general election and will become the first Muslim lawmaker in the state's history. The district includes part of Aurora and Arafia County. In the election, she defeated her opponent, Bob Andrews, winning 66% of the vote. Um, she's a first-generation American born in Denver to Palestinian Muslim parents who immigrated to the United States in 1974. Um, she grew up in Aurora and graduated from Overland High School. She has her undergraduate degree from University of Colorado, Denver, and master's degree in public administration. She's now a community activist, a community liaison for Interfaith Alliance of Colorado, and an educator, and now to become the first Muslim legis legislator in Colorado. In 2008, she founded uh, Meet the Middle East, a nonprofit whose mis mission is to bridge understanding between Americans and what she says is the most misunderstood region of the world. Um, she's definitely an empowering example of Muslim women in, uh, in politics in the House Capitol, a role model for young women and inspiration. Uh, for people of faith, uh, color, and background in the Muslim community. So as the first uh, Muslim lawmaker in Colorado's history, could you share your transition and journey into politics and the importance of being active in politics for Muslims? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is a pleasure right. and an honor to be here today. Um, speaking to this amazing group of individuals um, as a fellow Muslim. Um, I think this topic is incredibly important as we 
um, end out the past four years and look to a new beginning. Um, like Sister Beza so eloquently said, my name is Representative Elect Iman Judah, and I am the first Muslim and first Arab woman ever elected to the Colorado State Legislature. And I will be representing the 41st District in Aurora, Colorado, uh, and the House of Representatives. My journey into the political uh, realm was honestly unplanned and quite frankly, a little accidental. I am the daughter of Palestinian immigrants and refugees. I'm a first generation American and Coloradan. I'm a lifelong resident of Aurora, a practicing Muslim woman of color. And because of these identity markers, I have come to realize that like many Muslims around the world, oftentimes we inherit a obligation, a sense of duty around social justice and education. As a Palestinian and the daughter of refugees living in a diaspora, I've also understood the importance of what it means to advocate, to create space and grace and, and the openness to be willing to educate people. And for most of my life, that was often centered around Palestine, Islam, Muslims, and uh, the geopolitical situation of the Middle East. I remember as a very young child watching my parents blaze this trail in Colorado as educators, as lovers of social justice and democracy to make sure that we were welcoming in our neighbors and that they could have a chance to meet their Muslim neighbors, their Arab neighbors, and to understand the struggles of Palestinians. I also remember as a young child, growing up in the wake of two Gulf Wars, in the wake of the Iraq and Afghan War, and the ongoing struggles of Palestine, that we would receive threatening phone calls around our dinner table because people would look up our name look for Muhammad, and in those days we had the yellow pages and our phone number was listed. In the wake of 9-11, I distinctly remember that there were so many speaking requests coming into the masjid, to the Colorado Muslim Society where my father served as the co-founder of the largest and oldest mosque in the Rocky Mountain region. He was so inundated with speaking requests that I started to take over his overflow. So here I was, 19 years old, speaking to entire congregations about the most misunderstood religion in the world, speaking sometimes what it felt like on behalf of two billion people, a quarter of the world's population, and having to defend people who find sanctuary and a life in Islam against the actions of 19 individuals. But again, growing up in the wake and the shadow of my parents who made space and grace for education, I was also being uh, unknowingly conditioned to speak to non-Muslims, speak to Americans about Islam, about the uh, geopolitical situation in the Middle East. And as a result, I was able to take their message, to take their ability to teach and elevate it as a Western-born, Western-educated individual and use my understanding of our heritage, of our religion, and the cultural nuances that we understand here in the United States as Americans to be a better liaison and bridge for these two people. So carrying that message through in the wake of 9-11 was important for us. In Colorado, we were very blessed to have an outpouring of support to the Muslim community. I distinctly remember that there were so many people coming to Masjid Abu Bakr that in solidarity, people made three rings around the entire campus of the Masjid. Thousands of people came to show their solidarity. And I think in that spirit is what we need to remember in difficult times. After becoming a trained political scientist at the University of Colorado at Denver, 
and receiving my master's degree in public policy, I went into nonprofits. Founding my own nonprofit, Meet the Middle East, also allowed me to cradle my, my, my passion for education, teaching high schoolers, young professionals, and adults about Islam, about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, journeying with Americans to the Middle East and showing them and giving them a platform for educational immersion travel. And I think through this platform and medium of education, I was also able to give folks a different lens about what it is to be Muslim, what it is to be Arab in a time of Islamophobia, bigotry, and hate. I also used Meet the Middle East as a platform to advocate. I did a lot of consulting work with entities ranging from children's hospital to police departments to schools and universities about cultural competency around our newest neighbors, immigrants and refugees from the Muslim world, about Islam and the Middle East. And this allowed them to be better stewards of service uh, to our community. From there, I also became the community advocate and liaison at the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado, an organization that's really dedicated to voicing the progressive uh, voices in the interfaith uh, sphere. Through the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado, it put me on the front lines of the past six years at the Capitol during each legislative session. I was fighting for progressive causes and against bigotry and hate and regressive policy for the people of Colorado. And oftentimes it really translated into taking time to testify on a bill or legislation that was only three minutes to give a lens and a perspective from a Muslim perspective. And these bills ranged from anything from uh, equal pay to equal work for women re-envisioning how it is to hire formerly incarcerated individuals, fighting for civil rights, and oftentimes, unconsciously, delivering my testimony on issues that did not discriminate based on race or ethnicity or zip code or residency status or even religion, lawmakers saw a Muslim Palestinian Arab woman of color in front of them, testifying for a bill that they agreed with, testifying on a value that we could all come to the table on. And as a result, I was dismantling systemic racism and preconceived notions and stereotypes around Muslim, Muslim women, Arabs, and people who call the Middle East home coming together around shared issues, shared values, is what also made it important that we start to elect people that have those shared values and reflect our own self in our representation. My advocacy over the past decade and a half was never intended to culminate in a campaign or an elected position. To be quite honest, I did this work because I thought someone should probably say something about that issue. And I thought it was important that Muslims had a voice, an equal voice when we were drafting policy that affected all of us. And that's what took me to the Capitol, was to give people who don't have the opportunity to tell their story a platform because their story, their narrative, their history is equally as valid. And everyone has a right to be under that dome at the Capitol, and it's not a luxury. It's an absolute right. When I started to explore my option or my, my, my choice to run for office, I started to realize that there was no one who looked like me at the Capitol, who had my lived experiences. And living in HD 41 in Aurora, Colorado, one of the most diverse cities in America, I feel blessed to have a solid democratic base that believed in allowing our shared values to drive our vote and our representation. And that's what we decided to run on. 
we ran on the fact that it was important that everyone has a fair shot at the American dream. I myself, like many of you, are the product of that American dream. And many of you came to this country in search of that American dream. My parents dreamt that dream 50 years ago when they came here as immigrants and refugees from war-torn Palestine. They wanted to have a life and give their children things that they were never afforded simply because of their religion and nationality. And with hard work and determination, they were able to realize that dream. But 50 years later, that American dream is becoming harder and harder to realize with the rising costs of living, unattainable and unaccessible health care, our climate crisis, the violation of our civil rights, the lack of access to jobs and education. These are things that I want to fight for. These are things that I believe are at the core of that American dream. Now, November was a very interesting time for this nation. Not only did we make history by electing the first woman of color with a blended family to the executive branch, but we made history all across this nation by, rep by electing Muslim representatives up and down the ballot, from city council to school boards, to district attorneys, and to the House of Representatives and to House Senate. But we're not done. We are not done at all. That was just the beginning. Now is the time that we get to work. What happened to me in the week of the general election was that my Republican opponent decided to go negative. He decided to use my religion and my heritage against me to gain votes for himself. And I chose to stay silent. And I did that because the people of HD 41 clapped back. And they said, no longer are we going to allow bigotry and hate to dictate our values or our vote. And it was more important for the voters of Aurora to see themselves in their representation, to understand that we need to have representatives that believe that Black Lives Matter, that we need immediate and sustainable climate solutions that healthcare, jobs, education, and affordable housing are all basic human rights and not luxuries afforded to you based on the color of your skin, zip code, religion, or residency status. And it was evident the night of the election by winning 66% of the vote. And I'm proud of HD 41, proud of Aurora for showing up and saying we want to have representation that is a true breath and reflection of our community. And we came together and we did that as a community. Moving forward, this is where the real work starts. This is where we need to come together as a community, as a nation, and more importantly, as Muslims, to make sure that we, our voices are heard on all level, levels of government, whether it is your city council, whether it is your school board, your state house or your state senate, or your congressperson, or yes, even in the executive branch. We need to make sure that now we push for the values that we believe in and we believe should be reflected in our democracy and our American dream. One thing that was incredibly disheartening to me was I had a Muslim approach me and say, why should I vote for another white man? Why should I vote for someone who hurt the Muslim community abroad? And he had a very valid point. But my response to him was that now we have an obligation as Muslims to help guide them and teach our elected officials the true values of what we hold to be true. I'm so proud to be a practicing Muslim because the essence of democracy is the foundation of the principles we believe in as Muslims. We, the people, that all people are created equal. This is the bedrock of Islam. We are a very communal people. We are a very communal faith. And this is what I want to see in America. This is what I want to see emulated in our government, in our representation. When I decided to run for office, someone approached me and said, 
you know, Iman, what is going to, why did you choose to do this? And I, I told them exactly the same thing I told you here today. But one thing that many people don't realize is that in the Muslim world, this is commonplace. The Muslim world has democratically elected nine women heads of state. But to the Western world, there's a different lens. There's a different optics when it comes to Muslim women in politics. And I often reference Surat Al-Nisa, the, the chapter of the woman in the Quran. And dad always used to say, God saw fit to make a chapter in the Quran dedicated to women called the woman. But there's not a chapter called the man. And throughout the entire Quran, God gave rights dedicated to women 1400 years ago, not granted to women in the West until the 1920s. And some of these rights were in fact her right to vote, to participate in civil, civil duty in office, to own her own business, to inherit land and, and property, to hold on to her own wealth. And these are things that I hold true and important. So to us as Muslims, being elected as a Muslim woman is in fact commonplace. And we need to make sure that we are paving the way for future generations, for future women and future Muslim women to have a chance at their right to represent, to be civically engaged. I myself stand on the shoulders of women before me, of my mother, even people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. These were women who paved the way for women like myself, who stood up, stood up for the values that they believe in and stood up for the things that they believe women have a right to, an inherent human right. I stand on the shoulders of the people before me like the great MLK behind me, who fought for the rights of black, brown, and indigenous communities, of people of color, who truly did believe that all people were created equal. I'm getting emotional because these are the people that I wanna raise up in my tenure at the Capitol. These are the people and the voices that I wanna echo through the chambers of the House and the Senate. And it's important and we have an obligation to do so. And through policy, I hope to do that. I hope to raise up their voices and have them live through these policies. For me, my policies will in fact be centered around the issues I mentioned earlier, that civil rights, our climate crisis, jobs, education, affordable housing, and criminal justice reform should be at the forefront of our revolution, should be at the forefront of our policy agenda, making sure that we are taking care of future generations. On January 13th, when I'm sworn in as the first Muslim and Arab woman in the Colorado State House of Representatives, I will remember these people I will remember their struggles and the trails that they blazed for people like myself and for future generations. So that now this can be our commonplace, that this can be normalized, that people like you and I have a right to be represented and to represent. It's not lost upon me that it took a long time for us to get here. And maybe that is a little bittersweet, but we did it and we did it together. And the importance of diversifying our diversity in our representation should be something that we carry on as a mantle for future generations from here, forward, here, here, here on forward. A few months ago, I was invited to become a part of the Black Democratic Caucus in the Colorado State Capitol. Argu arguably, I am in fact the most unique incoming member of this freshman class. 
joining a caucus often means that you align with their ethnicity or religion. There is not a Muslim caucus. There is not an Arab caucus. But I am grateful to the Black Caucus for recognizing our shared kinship. And what I mean by that is as a Palestinian, as a Muslim, there is a inherited sense of oppression. When I am in Palestine, I am a second class citizen. I ride on a separate bus. I have no right to vote. We live behind a wall, our children are in cages and our oppressors put their knees on our necks. And for a long time, that was also commonplace in this country. But what gives me pause is that those same practices, even though they are illegal in this country today, only a generation ago, they were in fact legal. But they are manifesting themselves in a different way. And the Black Lives Matter movement has very much encompassed that shared oppression. For 400 years, our black and brown brothers and sisters have been subject to this oppression. And when you come together around that shared oppression, honoring the fact that there will be experiences and lived experiences that are unique to brown and black people. And in fact, there are experiences that are unique to the Palestinian people. You also realize that you are fighting for your civil rights, for your human rights. And because of this, the Democratic Black Caucus decided to adopt me as a full voting member. And I thought it was incredibly fitting. And I was very honored to receive this invitation so that we can in fact come together and fight for the vision, for that dream that MLK had to make sure that we are making that American dream a reality for everyone. I look forward to representing HD 41. I look forward to representing the people of Aurora and the people of Colorado. And I look forward to making sure that we are pushing for a progressive agenda. Someone once asked me, how can you be a practicing Muslim and a progressive Democrat? And I kind of looked at them. I said, there are two things that very much coincide. Progressives believe that women should get paid the same as men. So do Muslims. It's in the Quran. We believe that we have an obligation to take care of our earth, so do progressives. We believe that there should be criminal justice reform. We believe that housing and health care and jobs and education are all human rights, just like progressives. So for me, this is something that very much coincides with not only my faith and values, but my policy agenda as well. I want to thank you so much for inviting me here today, and I would love to open it up for an organic conversation and questions. Thank you for your beautiful speech. Um, it was definitely moving. And for our Muslim community, it's really important for us to have a solid example of a representative elect like you. Speaking of which, I have a question for you. Um, sure. Somebody asked, what will be your practical advice to young Muslims who want to be active in politics and contribute to the society as an American young Muslim? I love it. And thank you for the question. My first piece of advice would be unapo be unapologetic for who you are. Find a cause that you believe in. And even if that's multiple causes, they're all very valid. Fight for the good. Fight for your values, fight for your beliefs around that issue. And always remember that you will be the Muslim in the room and that you will be under that magnifying glass. But the more that you can shine as bright as you can be and come together around those shared values with our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, with our American community, you will be successful. And I urge people to become civically engaged. It is our Muslim duty to do so. Now, some people can't become civically engaged simply because of their residency status, but it doesn't mean that you can't participate. You may not have the vote yet, but you can work on a campaign. You can testify on a bill. You can help lawmakers craft legislation that reflects your community. You can volunteer for organizations that you believe in. 
you can help people. You can be that bridge between your community and the American and non-Muslim community. And that's important. We have to start somewhere and build a solid foundation for our community. Um, one more question. As you said earlier, um, after 9-11, you had to give a speech at the masjid. Um, somebody asked, can you share your feelings when you first made your speech instead of your father before the crowd? And have you stepped up as a 19-year-old? You know, my first speech um, in the wake of 9-11 was actually at a church. And um, there probably was close to 500 people in the congregation. It was packed. Now, I'm a little odd in the sense of I enjoy public speaking. <laughs> um, and that can be sometimes daunting for many people. But I remember looking out at the crowd and they were waiting for an explanation. They were waiting for me to say something that, that would speak on behalf of a quarter of the world's population. And I didn't. What I did was, again, I, sh I, I, I shined a light on those shared values that we all believe in. And I think that kind of, there was a collective sigh of relief around, wow, maybe what I was hearing about Muslims around Islam, around the Middle East, isn't exactly true. Because here I have a practicing Muslim Palestinian Arab woman of color in front of me saying something that I actually believe as well. And that was essentially the same thing that I took to the Capitol. I hope many young people will follow your footsteps. Um, we have a beautiful comment in the chat that I would like to share. So proud of you, sister. We applaud you for your courage, initiative, and inspiration that all our women need to see. Thank you very much. I am an incredible advocate for women's rights and, and especially for women of, of color and Muslim women. I want to make sure that we are on the forefront of advocacy and policy and that we create space for people to be heard in this, in this, in this realm. It's important for me. And I do hope that all people watching today can harness this power and, and be inspired to make change that they wish to see in their community. A third question is also interesting. Um, they asked, what would you say to the present and future haters who look down on people due to their religion or background? You know, um, I've had to deal with this my whole life. And I think the answer for me was, in fact, education. Teaching at the University of Denver about Islam, about Palestine, really gave me a platform to... Uh, dispel a lot of stereotypes and myths. Many people, and I think the statistic by Newsweek is something like one in five Americans have met a Muslim. That's not very many. Um, Islam continues to be one of the fastest growing religions in the world and in the United States. So we as Muslims, in fact, have an obligation to create a space for education invite them to break bread with our families um, and invite them to our masjid. You know, for me, one thing that I do is, you know, through my organizations that I'm involved with, through the masjid, I take to social media to create little videos about Islam, right? Um, I serve as the first female spokesperson for the Colorado Muslim Society or Masjid Abu Bakr which is the largest and oldest mosque in the Rocky Mountain region. And I use this platform to educate not only our Muslim community, but our non-Muslim community as well. And to be that face also starts to dismantle those stereotypes. Wow, here is the mosque who appointed a female Muslim to be their spokesperson. And I've actually gotten that question. What did your community think when they appointed a woman? And I was kind of taken aback because, again, in Islam, this is commonplace. Empowering women is our practice. And through these videos, right, whether it was through the nonprofits or my own organization or the masjid, we were, we were spreading education, creating a space that they can realize we have more in common than not. One of these videos I did through the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado, 
And I just went through points that I get a lot when I speak about Islam on the speaker circuit. And one of those was in fact around Jesus. We do believe Jesus is the Messiah and that one day he will return. Many people don't even know that we believe in Jesus. And again, making this space for people to understand we have more in common than not is important. And I think the more people can feel comfortable in that space, the more they're willing to ask questions, learn, and be receptive to those answers. Thank you. Um, I know you said you would like to work on education, healthcare, and climate change. Um, somebody also asked, um, since you said you would like to work on bills about climate change, how do you see a connection uh, with that, um, with the Islamic faith? I, you know, for me, I think it's incredibly important. You know, uh, uh, the, the the hadith, I believe, is is that when we go to war, um, we are not allowed to even cut down a living tree or plant, destroy our lived environment. For me, that's what we're doing right now. This is our lived environment. We don't have a planet B. As Muslims, we have an obligation to take care of God's creation. And this is exactly what we need to do as Muslims, as people, as a human race. We need to take care of this blessed earth that we have. There are future generations where I have genuine anxiety about what kind of planet they're going to inherit. And I think and I believe as Muslims, as human beings, regardless of your faith, your party affiliation, your nationality, or anything that you identify with, we all have an obligation to pass on a planet that is sustainable, that is livable, and that has a future. I think about my nephews and my niece and what kind of planet they're going to inherit from me. And if I'm not taking my own steps to make sure that they have a sustainable planet, then I'm doing them and their fellow future generations a disservice. So as Muslims, again, not only embracing, but taking care of God's creation is something that I think is incumbent upon all of us. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, the fifth question is um, actually related to what you said earlier when a Muslim person approached you and said, how can you be Muslim and a progressive Democrat? Somebody asked, um, when you're conflicted with Muslim views, with democratic views, um, how do you approach that conflict? Yeah, it's a good question. And you know what, here's the thing is that even as a Democrat, and I can speak you know, as now an elected official, even within the Democratic Party, we are not a monolith. As Muslims, we are not a monolith. And, and that, that's almost the beauty of it. I think that's what makes us better. Um, we have varying views. We, and as Muslims, we have varying views of culture and, and varying views of religiosity. And that's okay. To me, it's how are you a good person? The way I like to describe Islam is in a 1090 kind of way. 10% is your personal da'a, your personal prayer, your personal practice. But 90% of that is in fact how you um, emulate your Islam and your practice in community. How are you a good person? How are you a pillar of your community? And for me, that will be emulated through education and through the policy that I, that I vote on and that I draft. And there are, in fact, issues that may, may feel that they go against your personal values, whatever party you belong to or identify with. And that's okay. I don't think anyone, not even the president-elect, may be fully aligned with the entire democratic agenda. We each have our own lived experiences that we bring to that platform. And that, again, is what makes this so beautiful. That's what makes democracy work, is when we can bring our lived experiences and our personal values to the platform and give our insight when we're drafting and voting on policy. And, you know, the reality is, is that there are issues that um, uh, many Muslims feel like don't reflect their belief. And again, that is okay. But we need to make sure that we are aligning with a party that reflects 
most of our beliefs. And again, this is where we get to work so we can help guide our elected officials towards the values that we believe in. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask one more question. Um, since you're presenting people of all um, backgrounds, um, what is your approach to people across the aisle and how do you plan to uh, focus on building a bridge to race um, and reflect on common issues? It's a great question. And, you know, for me and something that I have really upheld through my campaign was my dedication to, in fact, reaching across the aisle. I want to make sure that um, on as many bills and legislation that I draft and bring to the House floor, that I have Republican support and that I have Republican legislators signing on to my bills. Um, the reality is, is that, yes, we may identify differently as Republicans and Democrats, but we all live here and we're all kind of on the same team, believe it or not. How we get to that solution may very much differ. But again, I think that's what makes this process so beautiful. Um, the people across the aisle are in fact that, they are people like you and I, and they have beliefs and practices that are, um, they believe are important and also worthy to bring to the representation. I am in no place to discount that belief. Um, and so I will do my best to always reach across the aisle and have those relationships so that when we are in a time of need. It's not a reactionary uh, um, uh, uh, response, but rather one built on a solid foundation. Thank you. Um, so I know you gave an advice to young uh, Muslims, but um, we have more specific question here. Would you have any advice for Muslims in your district or actually in America to uh, get involved in politics? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, again, we have an obligation as Muslims to be involved and we have a right to be involved on all levels of politics, whether it's local, state or federal. Um, and politics doesn't have to manifest itself through a campaign or an election. Um, it can manifest itself by, again, policy or testifying or, you know, um, uh, 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 um, influencing um, beliefs and 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 making sure that we are, again, diversifying the diversity in our representation. What I would really like to say is that I think it's important that we help our elected officials have the exposure that they need to our communities, invite them into our spaces so that they feel like they are welcomed, but also have a space to come to when they need advice from the Muslim community. You know, here in Colorado, our masjid is always open. And one thing that I have made a vow to do is once elected, help my fellow legislators, Republican and Democrat, reach out to their Muslim communities, to their immigrant and refugee communities, to their black, brown, indigenous, and people of color communities to make sure that they have a relationship. Because again, the more you have this solid relationship, when something happens, when we're in a time of need, it's not reactionary right? It's more of a solid, unified response. Um, you call Islam as the most misunderstood religion of the world, and we live in a time where there's unfortunately still Islamophobia. So I would like to ask you personally, how have you responded to all the stereotypes or stereotypical criticisms about Islam or behaviors against you for being Muslim? You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said, women belong in places where all decisions are being made. And for six years, I have put myself at the Capitol um, to help influence policy and to help guide lawmakers and to testify on policy. And by doing this, I was also there in the space as a practicing Muslim, as a representative of the community, as a Palestinian American woman of color. And the more that I advocated for these policies or fought against Islamophobic or bigoted or hate, hatred policies, the more people were able to see that here she is, a Muslim, who is coming to defend a policy that we believe in or to fight against a policy that is regressive for the people of Colorado. 
And again, it wasn't always around religious beliefs. It was really centered around issues that affected us all. So the more that we can come together around shared issues, shared values that do not discriminate based on anything, right? For example, I really believe that everyone should have access to quality health care. That is not a red or blue issue. That is not a, a, a Islamic or Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or atheist issue. We are human beings that hold different identity markers that all need health care. And um, again, I think the more that we can put ourselves in these spaces where decisions are being made, we have a right to be in these spaces and to help give the perspective from a Muslim lens, the more we are breaking down Islamophobia, bigotry, and hate. Um, assuming that we don't have questions now, I would like to ask you one, because sure. you said when you were giving your speech that your transition into politics was accident accidental. So um, how, when, like, what made you decide that you want to run for office? You know, there wasn't one moment, but I think a story that I tell quite a bit is um, four years ago, uh, the day after the election, I was brushing my teeth and, and I was looking at myself in the mirror. My father had just passed away. My brothers and sisters had moved away. So it was just my mother and I in the house. My mother wears the hijab full time. And all I could think was, I need to be prepared to book two one-way tickets for my mother and I to go live in our home in Palestine. I didn't do that. And shortly after the election, we started to organize and realize that we, you know, the people need to come together to fight a lot of the rhetoric that was coming out of the Trump campaign at the time, and now transitioning into the Trump White House. Six months later, when I told that story to a friend, he said, I find it curious that you thought it would be better to go live under occupation, apartheid, and oppression in Palestine rather than stay in the United States as an American citizen. I had never looked at it that way. I looked at it as simple survival. But again, I think as someone who has inherited a conflict, and who has inherited this obligation to educate and advocate for social justice, I realized that there was a need that needed to be filled, that there was a void in our representation. And I never did it, you know, to be the first. I never did it because, you know, uh, someone should probably be a Muslim or an Arab representing the people of Colorado. I never did it for that. As a matter of fact, someone had to tell me that I would be the first. <laughs> I did it because I really felt like it was important that the representation be a true breath and reflection of our community. And again, in Aurora, being one of the most diverse cities in America, we needed to make sure that we carry that through our representation. Um, I think I'm speaking for all the Muslim community and for all women when I say that we're really proud of you. Um, we're out of questions, but if there's anything you would like to add or share with us, we would be more than happy. You know, I think, you know, today's Christmas and um, I'm spending my day with um, a brother, uh, a brother here in Colorado. His name is Brother Jeff. He's an African-American Muslim who has a cultural center and we are volunteering to prepare 500 meals for anyone in need. And Again, I think this is such a beautiful display of our shared humanity and our shared values and our faith, quite frankly. Um, I do think it's important that we use this time as we end the year of 2020 to reflect and to also be reminded of our gratitude as we go into 2020 that this hardship and that the scars that we bear from 2020 and beyond will make us stand stronger and taller and be better advocates for our community and for the people moving forward. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much um, uh, for your time. It was a pleasure to be talking with you. I think people are really inspired and moved by your speech. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Take care. Thank you.
Sierra Reading Contest is back with generous awards organized by Green Dome Foundation. This year's contest features two books, Muhammad, His Life Based on the Earliest Sources, and The Messenger, Prophet Muhammad and His Message of Compassion. The top 11 winners in each book's contest will receive $500 each. For the young readers under 14 years, the test will be from the book Prophet Muhammad, The Age of Bliss. The first 11 children in the contest will each receive a $100 Amazon gift card. For more information, please visit www.whoisprophetmuhammad.com.